Hello and welcome to uh, Minister Online Training Center. My name is Jeff Jackson and I will be the voice of the Holy Spirit for the next 55 minutes or so. And I'd just like to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just ask a special blessing for those who are gonna hear this lesson. I ask that you look through their eyes so they can see your word, that you look through their ears, that you touch through their ears so they can hear your word, that you touch through their hearts so they can feel your word, that you touch through their mind so they can understand your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you look through my eyes, you speak through my mouth, and you touch through my heart the lesson that you want taught today, and that it brings forth a great harvest, but not our will, but your will be done. Amen. Okay, today we are going to start a new lesson, and that lesson is going to be on the imagination. And before I get into the lesson, I'd just like to uh, talk to you about the syllabus. Okay, the class will be taught on videotape lessons, which will be available to you 24 hours a day and seven days a week on the internet. This will be taught through 20 hours of videotape lessons, and each of the 20 lessons will be approximately 55 minutes in duration. There will be a homework, there will be homework assignments, written assignments, midterm and final examination. Class description. The class will be an in-depth study of the imagination as it is revealed in the Bible. There will be emphasis placed on how a believer should use their imagination in God's kingdom. The students should be able to explain how to use the imagination. What is the imagination? Where is the imagination? How to manifest your imagination? How you Use your imagination to determine where you are in your life or where you want to be in your life. The class objective. The class objective is to learn with the intentions of teaching different aspects of the imagination as it is defined and explained in God's word according to 2 Timothy 2.15. The Amplified Version says to study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial, a workman who needs, who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. And in Mark 11, 22 and 23 it says, and Jesus answering and said unto them, have faith in God. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he say shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Class guidelines. Each class video should be viewed and reviewed, and a scriptural reference should be undertaken until clearly understood. All assignments are to be completed and submitted by timely submitted timely by email. There will be a response paper and a response paper is limited to one page which is answering two questions. What I learn and what I plan to do with what I have learned. The course requirement will be successful completing all reading assignments, written assignments, response papers and both the midterm and final examination within the prescribed time. The grading will be as follows. A response paper, which will be 10 points. A midterm exam, which will be 40 points. A final exam, which will be 50 points. The exam will be both objective and subjective. A passing grade for examinations in the course will be 70 points or higher and there will be due dates and there will be it as a sign and our um, bibliography will be the Holy Bible. Amen? Okay, now the topic that we're going to be discussing is imagination. And when I uh, put or looked up imagination in the Bible, I found out that there were 13 um, scriptural references to imagination. But what I what amazed me was that most of them were all negative, and I would just like to go over some of them so you can kind of get an understanding. In Genesis 6, verse 5, that's Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it reads, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. 
Genesis 8, 21 reads, and that's Genesis 8, chapter 8, verse 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. And in Deuteronomy 29:19. Deuteronomy 29 19 reads and it came to pass when he heard the words of this curse that he blessed himself in his heart saying I shall have peace though I walk in the imaginations of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst and Deuteronomy 31 21 reads and it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imaginations which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. And out of all the um, scripture reference imagination, this was the only positive one I found. And it's in First Chronicles 29.18. It says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers kept this forever in the imaginations of their thoughts, of the heart of thy people, and prepared their heart unto thee. This was referring to when um, King David was preparing uh, the resources for the house of God, and he started contributing uh, gold from his own uh, possessions, silver, brass, and all the materials that the house of God would need. And the people, they had an inclination to do the same thing. And it was such an outpouring that David said to keep this in their imaginations and otherwise, other words, keep this in their memory. Have them keep this in their memory so that they would always remember the blessings that were poured out because they decided to do, or they decided to follow the love that they had for God in their heart. And that's what we need to do. See, the imagination, it's easy for us to use our imagination for negative things. If you think about it, if you think about sin, it comes about naturally. But if you want to think about something of God, you have to put some effort into it. And my text scripture is Mark eleven twenty three, And it reads, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now I would like to give you a definition of the imagination. The imagination is the power or faculty of the mind by which it conceives and forms ideals of things communicated to it by the organs of sense. The word imagination in Hebrew is yeser, and it means a form, figuratively, conception that is purpose, frame or to frame things of the mind or work. Uh, some more definitions is, is the conception, the image, in the mind, or the idea. Number two is the act of inventing, devising, or planning. Number three is schemes form in the mind or device. Number four is the part of the mind where ideas, thoughts, and images are formed. Number five is the first motion or purpose of the mind. And number six is the ability to form images and ideals in the mind, especially of things never seen or experienced directly. Now let's look at some original creative instances of the imagination. And it's found in Genesis first chapter, verse three. And in Genesis 1, 3 it reads, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. In verse 4 it reads, And God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And drop down to verse 6 it reads, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. 
And you drop down to verse 9, it reads, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 10 reads, And God called the earth land. Excuse me, God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now let's drop down to verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, excuse me, verse 21, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Verse 25. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after his kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. And verse 21, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. In the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Uh, now let's turn to Genesis 2, 18 and 19. And Genesis 2, 18 reads, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I would make him a helpmeet for him. Verse 19, and out, of all the, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. I have a question. How could Adam name something that he never saw? The answer is Adam used his imagination. Now let's read Genesis 2, 20 through 23. In verse 20 it reads, And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Here again, Adam used his imagination to name something he never saw. In verse 24 it reads, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Verse 25, And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. 
One of our earlier definitions of imagination is presented in the creation. What, and that definition was the ability to form images and ideals in the mind, especially of things never seen or experienced directly. Everything God created was never seen before he created them. In fact, God used his imagination to create everything that was created. Let's look at the formula that God used to create everything. First, God saw what he wanted in his imagination. Secondly, God spoke it out of his mouth. Thirdly, God saw it with his eyes. Guess what, church? This very formula that God used to create everything is available to us too. Everyone has an imagination. The problem is that some of us have not used it so have not used our imagination for so long that we forget that it even exists. And guess what? The enemy does not want you to remember that you do have an imagination. Why? Well, let's think about this for a minute. If you realize the power of your imagination, how much damage you can do to the kingdom of darkness. The enemy wants you to believe that you believe what you see is your reality. Remember how we are supposed to walk? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 reads, For we walk by faith and not by sight. With correct knowledge and understanding of your imagination, you can create healing in your life, prosperity in your life, renew relationships, peace, joy, love, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, humility, courage, and so on. In fact, instead of circumstances being in control of you, you would be in control of your circumstances by using your imagination. In fact, you would be able to create your own universe. Sounds a lot like God to me. You have the very power to create your world already inside of you. Your imagination is a gift of God. Now let's go back to Genesis 1.26 again. And it reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Listen to what the listen to what the Lord wants us to do. Here are some different translations of the same scripture, and I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter five, verse one. And this is the analytical literal translation. It reads, Therefore, continue becoming imitators of God as beloved children. Verse 2. And be walking about, conducting yourselves in love, as also Christ loved us and gave himself, or handed himself over, on our behalf, as an offering and a sacrifice to God, for odor of sweet smell, or a sweet smelling aroma. The same uh, scriptures in verse in the Amplified Version reads, Therefore be imitators of God, copy him, and follow his example. As well beloved children, imitate their father. And walk in love, esteeming and delighting in one another, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a slain offering sacrifice to God for you, so that it became a sweet fragrance. That same verse in the contemporary English version reads, Do as God does. After all, you are his dear children. Let love be your guide. Christ loved us and offered his life for us as a sacrifice that pleases God. 
And the King James Version reads, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Ephesians 5.1 Watch what God does. This is the Message Bible. It says, watch what God does. Then do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Verse 2. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He did love in order to get something from us, but to give something of himself to us love like that. Remember those dreams that you had? Remember daydreaming as a kid? Some of us wanted to be a doctor, an engineer, school teacher, a nurse, a business owner, a chef, a pilot, a fireman, an athlete, a social worker, a pastor, an architect, a mechanic, an accountant, all these dreams were part of your imagination. A lot of us were told that daydreaming and dreams were a waste of time, or that we should spend our time doing something productive. Now we see that the enemy was behind our discouragement of using our imagination. The imagination is the place where conception of an ideal takes place. And in the natural, when a man and a woman comes together and conceive a child, the child is not born right after conception. There is a time period between conception and birth. What the couple does is begin to make preparations for the child. They, uh, they get a nursery, they prepare a nursery. If the woman was a drinker or a smoker, she should stop for the sake of the baby. She has regular checkups with her pediatrician. She can, they consider moving to a bigger place if possible. They start, or she starts eating healthier. They start buying baby clothes, bottles, diapers, crib toys, car seats, strollers, high chairs, play pens, baby furniture, baby dishes, and so on. The same is said about a new job. You start preparing for a job before you even work one day. You use your imagination about what you plan on buying with the money you expect to receive from a job that you have not yet worked. You use your imagination about bills you want to pay off. You use your imagination about money you want to save. You use your imagination about the house you want to buy. You use your imagination about the car you want to buy. All of this you haven't even received a paycheck yet. Listen to some of the ancient things that were created because of someone's imagination. The knife, which was created 2,500,000 to 1,400,000 B.C. Fire, which was created 100 million, excuse me, 1 million B.C. Housing, which was created 500,000 years B.C. Clothing, which was created between 500,000 and 100,000 B.C. Spears, which were created 400,000 B.C. Pigment, which is color, which was created 400,000 B.C. Bolts, which were created 600, excuse me, 60,000 B.C. Musical instruments, which were created 50,000 B.C. Twisted rope, which was created 17,000 B.C. The wheel, which was created 5,000 B.C. Now listen to some of these modern inventions which were created from someone's imagination. The World Wide Web, a USB flash drive, lithium batteries, Windows operating program, the MP3 format, broadband, and broadband refers to a telecommunications signal or device or greater bandwidth in some sense than another standard or usual, or usual signal or device. And the broader the band, the greater the capacity of traffic. Electrical cars, camera phones, GPS systems, Google, 
SMS, which stands for short, short message system. And that is a text messaging service component a phone, web or mobile communication system use standardized communication protocols that allow the exchange of short text messages between fixed line or mobile phone devices. Now let's look at some other inventions created from someone's imagination. Television, airplanes, jets, computers, DVDs, DVD players, microwaves, washers, dryers, ovens, refrigerators, cars, motorcycles, trains, electricity, indoor plumbing, telephones, cell phones, helicopters, rockets. All these were created because of someone's imagination. Memory is a very important part of the imagination. When reading God's Word, using our imagination will help us to visualize and may even help us to understand what we have just read. Here's an example. Um, David and Goliath. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17.1. And in 1 Samuel 17, 1 reads, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle and were assembled in Sukkoth, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sukkoth and Azekath and Epis Damon. Verse 2. Saul and the men of Israel were encamped in the valley of Ella and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. Verse 3. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valleys between them. Now there, here are these two armies. They had one army, the Philistines, on one mountain. They had Israel's army on the other mountain, and there was a valley in between. And verse 4 reads, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, a Gath, who hiked with six cubits and a span. Now using your imagination, well not using your imagination, we don't have any idea what six cubits is. So six cubic, if a cubic is the length of the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, is about one and twelve feet. And the span of the distance from the thumb to the middle or little finger will stretch apart the full length, be half a cubit. Six cubits in a span will equal about nine feet, nine inches. So we are told, or from this definition, that Goliath was anywhere from nine feet, nine inches to ten feet tall. In verse 5 it reads, And he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of mail, and the coat weighed five thousand shackles of bronze. Now, coat of mail, or breastplate, breastplate of scales, is a kind of a metal skirt protect, protecting protecting the back as well as the breast and made of scales like those of a fish. And it said that it weighed five shekels, 5,000 shekels, which is probably about 157 pounds. It is very probable that Goliath's breast coat may have been long preserved as a trophy, as we know his sword was, and so the weight of it is ascertained. In verse 6 reads, he had bronze shin armor on his leg and a bronze javelin across his shoulder. Greaves of brass upon his leg, it means this species of armor may be seen on many ancient monuments. It was a plate of brass, though perhaps sometimes form of lemire or pallet, like the mail, which covered the shin of fore part of the leg for the knee, from the knee down to the insep and was buckled with a strap behind the leg. And it says it had a target of blast between its shoulders. When not actually engaged, soldiers threw their shield behind their back so that they appeared to rest or hang between the shoulders. Verse 7 reads, And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spear head weighed 600 shackles of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. 
The spear's head literally is the flame of the spear, the metal part which, which flashes like a flame. And 600 shackles is between 17 and 18 pounds. Taking the proportions of things unknown to those known, the armor of Goliath is supposed to have weighed not less than 272 pounds and 13 ounces. In verse 8 it reads, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let them come down to me. In other words, while these two armies were on this, these mountains and this valley was between them, Goliath was shouting to the armies of Israel. In other words, all this time that was going on, no one was fighting. All they were doing was talking. You know, it's like you want to fight. You know, you, you, you know how when you really don't want to hit nobody, or especially you don't want anybody to hit you, <laughs> you start acting like you want to fight. But you pray to God that he doesn't swing on you first. Or you hope that if you swing, you hit him. That's pretty much what was going on. In verse 9, it says, If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servant. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servant and serve us. In verse 10 it reads, And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Sometimes your situations and your circumstances will talk to you. You know, like when you have that pain and you say out your own mouth, it must be this or it must be that. Or you're going through financial uh, situations and you're already have in your heart, I'm not going to be able to pay this, I'm not going to pay, be able to pay that. You're already making excuses or you're already uh, saying what the negative that's going to happen from your imagination concerning the situation. In verse 11 it reads, And Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Sometimes your situations and your circumstances will cause you to be fearful. 2 Timothy 1.7 reads, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So anytime, in any situation that you're fearful about anything, the first thing you need to realize is that it's a spirit. And it is not a spirit of God, it's the spirit of the enemy. So that should encourage you right now because if that spirit of fear is coming against you, it's letting you know that whatever you're doing or thinking about doing has to be something from God and the enemy does not want that to come to pass. Amen? In verse 12 it reads, David was the son of an Eparite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. Jesse, in the days of Saul, was old, advanced in years. In verse 13 it reads, his three eldest sons had followed Saul into battle. Their names was Elab, the firstborn, next Abadab, and the third Shammah. In verse 14 it reads, David was the youngest, the three elders followed Saul. Verse 15, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. In verse 16, the Philistines came out morning and evening presenting himself for 40 days. So for 40 days all they were doing was talking about what they were going to do. Well actually it doesn't say what Israel was saying. In other words, Goliath was doing all the talking and Israel was so fearful they did not say a word. Your situations and circumstances will continue to get worse until you take authority over them. In other words, if you're going through something, they're not going to get better if you just sit back and just allow it to happen. What you need to do is take authority over that, and the way you take authority is using God's word. Amen? And in verse 17, it says, And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers the epith of the parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to your brothers at the camp. In verse 18, it reads, Also take these ten cheese to the commander of their thousands, See how your brothers fare, and bring some token from them. In verse 19, Now Saul and the brothers and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Well, I don't know how they were fighting because there was no fighting going on. Maybe they were fighting them mentally, but they were not fighting them verbally, and they were not fighting them um, physically. Verse 20, So David rose up early the next morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions, and went. 
as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the encampment as the host going forth to the battleground shouted the battle cry. Verse 21, And Israel and the Philistines put the battle in array, army against army. Verse 22, David left his packages in the care of the baggage keeper and ran into the ranks and came and greeted his brothers. Verse 23, And as they talked, behold, Goliath the champion, the Philistines of Gath, came forth from the Philistines' rank and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. It's like when you're talking to someone and you hear something negative about something or someone you care about. You want to rebuke that person. It's like when you're talking to someone, you know, hey man, how you doing? And someone over here says something negative all across the room. The first thing you do, you automatically, you stop and you listen. And you wasn't paying attention, but because it's something dear to your heart, you hear it. And all of a sudden, you kind of get upset because you know it's not true. It's like if someone says something about your kid. Even though it may be true, they don't have the right to say it because that's your kid. And that's what David was, that was going on with David. Goliath was coming against his God. And all the armies of Israel, they took it. But when David heard this, he was... He had what we call a righteous indignation. In other words, you're not going to just stand up here and say something about my God and, not, and me not defend it. Verse 24 reads, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, terrified. Now think about this. Goliath is still on this mountain, a valley between them. And they saw him and they ran. Now how fearful is that? Now anything... I at least waited for him to get in the valley before I ran. He was on the other side of the mountain, and they were so fearful, they ran. To show you what fear would do for you or to you. Verse 25 reads, And the Israelites says, Have you seen this man who has come out? They're talking to David now. Surely he has come out to defy Israel. And the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free from taxes and service in Israel. Verse 26, And David said to the man standing by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistines and take away this reproach from Israel? Now they just told him what would be done or what would happen for the man to kill him. But David, David already had a plan. David wanted to make sure, because David knew what he was going to do or what the Lord was going to have him do or what he was going to do from or through the Spirit of the Lord. So he asked the same question, What will be done for this man that kills this Philistine? I'll read it again. And David said to the man, verse 26, Standing by him, what shall be done for this man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 27, And the men told him, Thus shall it be done for the man who kills him. Verse 28, Now Elop, his eldest brother, heard what he said to the men, and Elop's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why did you come here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evilness of heart, for you came down that you might see the battle. Now one thing we have to remember, this is verse 17, but in verse 16, David had already been anointed king. So it seems like there was some jealousy going on with his older brother and with David. It's like when Joseph had told his brothers the dream that he had, and their first inclination was to kill him. Because they did not, either they did not believe, or they did not want to believe, or they were just plain jealous because of his dream. See, God can give you a dream, or put something in your imagination, and sometimes you just, not, you just cannot tell everyone about it, because everyone about it does not, or will not feel the same way about your dream. Amen? And in verse 29 it says, And David said, What have I done now? What is not was it not a harmless question? In other words, all David wanted to know was what this giant, who, why, first of all, David had an attitude because he saw the army, a whole army of God's children. And they, David remembered from, you know, stories how God had delivered Israel from all their enemies. And here, they, here he, David sees them standing and fearful of one man. In verse 30 it says, And David turned away from Elab to another, and he asked the same question again. Now this is the third time he asked, What will be done for the one who kills the giant? And the men gave him the same answer. 
In verse 31 it reads, When David's words were heard, they were repeated to Saul, and he sent for him. In other words, the men around him knew something was going on because David asked three times what's going to happen to the one who kills him. So they said, you know what? Let's go tell Saul that at least, this, at least we have someone that's an Israelite that's asking what's going to be done. So they knew that something was special in David. So what they did, they ran to the king and they said, King Saul, <laughs> I don't know if we have a sacrificial lamb or what, but we have this kid. And he's asking about what's going to be done. So I think we think he wants to do something. So we're going to bring him to you because, to be honest, we're all scared. In verse 32, it reads, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight with them. Now you have to remember, Goliath was a man of battle. He's been fighting for, for years. So he had to be, you know, at least... It doesn't say his, his years, but, he, you know, I would say 25 to 30 to 35. And here David was a kid. It doesn't say he was a man, so he had to be a teenager, maybe 14, 15, 16, 17 at the most. And here he is saying, you know what, Saul, King Saul, you don't have to worry about a thing. I will go out and fight against him. Now, the king should have been impressed right then and there. Even if it was David was going to go out and die, that he had the inclination to say, you know what, I'm not afraid. And that's what we need to understand about our imagination. Sometimes something will come out in our imagination that will be so fearful because in our own, we can't do it. But that should be a great thing because if we can't do it, guess what? That means the Lord is going to do it. So, and the enemy is trying to bring this fear because he does not want what's in your imagination to come to pass. Because first of all, if God is giving you, to, giving you this vision in your imagination, guess what? It's for the glory of God. And the enemy does not want you to do anything that's going to bring glory to God. Amen? And in verse 33 it says, And Saul said to David, You are not able to fight against this Philistine. You are only an adolescent, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now here David is come to say, You know what? I'll fight against him. Saul doesn't have anyone in his army that has the kahunas to go out and fight against him. And here Saul is telling David, he's discouraging David. He's telling David that, you know, you're just a kid. You can't do this. Sometimes you have to keep your positive thoughts of your imagination to yourself because some people may try to discourage you. Verse 34 reads, And David said to Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep. And when there came a lion, or again a bear, and took a lamb out of his flock, it says, I went after it and smote it and delivered the lamb out of his mouth. And when it rose again against me, I caught it by the beard and smote it and killed it. Use your imagination to remember what God has done for you in the past and reflect on your current situation. In other words, if you remember what God has done for you in the past, how he has delivered you from whatever situation you, you were in, when this current situation comes up, use your imagination to reflect on that to deal with your current situation. Also, use your imagination to remember what God's victories have in your life or the victories that God has used in your life in the past. Verse 36 reads, Your servant killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like unto them, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. Sometimes you have to remember your past in order to deal with your present. Use your imagination to remember God's word and use it as a weapon. Here's a scripture to, uh, to reflect on that, what I just read. Psalms 121.1. It reads, I will lift up my eyes until the hill, for whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and from evermore. Amen. 
And in verse 37 of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, it reads, And God said, The Lord, excuse me, David said, The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. David used his memory to remember how God had delivered him from the bear and the lion. And he used his imagination to picture God delivering him from the hand of Goliath. Sometimes we need to do the same thing we were going through trials and tribulation. We need to remember what God has done for us in the past and use our imagination to, to picture God doing the same thing for us in the present. Verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. Sometimes people may try to burden you with their fears to help you in your situation. 1 Samuel 17:39 reads, And David girded his sword over his armor. Then he tried to go, but he could not, for he was not used to it. And David said to Saul, I could not go with these, for I'm not used to them. And David took them off. God calls not believing him evil. Hebrews 3.12 reads, Take heed, brother, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Verse 13, But exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of his sin. In verse 12 it says, Least there be any of your evil heart of unbelief. See, unbelieving or not believing God is called evil because what you're pretty much saying is God is a liar. And God takes it very personal when someone calls him a liar. Uh, 1 Samuel 17:40 reads, Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag. A whole kid skins slung from his shoulders in his pouch and his sling was in his hand and he drew near the Philistines. Learn to believe in God's word and not in the situation or circumstances. Proverbs 3 5 reads, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And remember, evil is not believing God. In verse 41, it reads, And the Philistines came on and drew near to David, the man who bore the shield before him. Verse 42. And when the Philistines looked around and saw David, he scorned and despised him, for he was but an adolescent with a healthy reddish color and a fair face. Verse 43, And the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come on, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Verse 45, Then David said to the Philistines, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the race of Israel, whom you have defiled. This is an awesome scripture to use against your situations and your circumstances. Say this to your health, your finances, your relationships, to unemployment, to poverty, or to anything that is not lining up to God's word. For example, if you're having problems with your health, you say, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, of the ranks, to whom you have defiled. And I command and demand that you leave this body right now. I will not receive what you are trying to bring against me. My body is the temple of the most Holy Spirit, and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am healed in every area of my life from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Use God's word against what's attacking you. Because whatever's attacking you, guess what? It is an enemy. In verse 46 it reads, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and cut off your head. And I will give the course of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild of the beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 
the same curse that Goliath said that he was going to do to David, David used that same curse against Goliath. And it says that this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Psalms 118.24 says, This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And in verse 47 it reads, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. And in Psalms 27 it reads, Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Verse 8. They are bought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Verse 9. Save the Lord, let the King hear us when we call. The Lord wants us to tell the world that we are serving a mighty God. And as you as uh, teachers, that's what you want to instill to your students, that we are serving a mighty God. But before you can instill it to your students, you have to make sure it's instilled in you. Amen? And in Mark 8.38 it reads, More Excuse me, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in his glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know when you're at your job and you hear people talking negatives and instead of you saying, you know what, God can deliver you or that's not right or the word says, you, you coward, you don't say anything. In fact, you... you in your heart, you say, me leaving this conversation is doing justice to God. No, you opening your mouth and you, you sharing your love with your love of God with those people, or better yet, leading them to the Lord. That's bringing glory and honor to the Lord. Amen. And in First Samuel seventeen forty eight, it reads, When the Philistines came forward to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistines. See, David did not wait for the battle to come to him. David ran to the battle. And that's what we need to do. If something is attacking us, what we need to do, we need to run and attack it or them. We should have the same mindset when we want to obtain something from our imagination. We should go after it with everything that is within us. And verse 49. David put his hand into the bag and took out his stone and slung it, and it struck the Philistine, sinking into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. Did you notice that the stone struck Goliath in the only area that was not protected? Verse 50, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck down the Philistine and slew him, but no sword was in David's hand. Verse 51, so he ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of his seat, and killed it, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their mighty champion was dead, they fled. Did you know that when you stand over something, that you have dominion over it? David took the weapon of the enemy and used it for the good of God. In Genesis 50, 20 it says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And in 17, excuse me, 1 Samuel 17, 52 reads, And the men of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded, so that the wounded Philistines fell along the way from Sharion as far as Gath and Ekron. When you use your imagination and have positive results, it can inspire others to use their imaginations. So in closing, I just want to let you know that your imagination is a part of the mind that you use to bring what you want to come to pass. And you have to remember, if it doesn't come to pass in the next five minutes, it does not mean that it did not happen. It just means it hasn't manifested. And what you need, you need to just be patient and wait on the Lord. In Psalms 46, 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. And some of us, we just cannot be still. We want to try to do it on our own. So until we meet next time, I just want you to continue to walk in the blessings of the Lord. And you are righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Amen.